my job is to tell you a little bit about the challenges. I've been involved in a number of studies looking at some of these technical challenges, and I'll just try to give you um, some of the highlights here. Just a little bit about my perspective. As the director of the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, our job is to take these unique capabilities of these petascale machines today and the kinds of exascale machines that we hope to be able to build in the next decade and provide them to the broad science community. So we've got 4,000 users actually using the facility. Um, today we have a petascale system called Hopper, named after Grace Murray Hopper at NERSC. And, um, and it's really about uh, how you, you make that available to the science community that works on all of the different problems that you've talked about. Um, the challenge, as you've heard before, is uh, really about the power problem. That is, how do you how do you um, turn on the how do you pay for and um, provide enough electricity for an exascale computer if you were going to build it today? So um, Tom mentioned that it would be would require um, on the order of a gigawatt, um, and that's the, that's the same thing. If we took today's technology and we tried to build a computer, that means that we would need to have our own power plant um, just to run that computer. And um, now. Computer technology doesn't stand still, and one of the and there was a study that was done um, by DARPA looking at how will the power requirements go down as we look at how chips evolve over time. So as you know, Moore's law makes it puts more allows us to put more transistors on a on a pro, on a chip every couple of years, and so that also brings down our energy requirements. And what happens if you look at, though, at the study in terms of where that will get us, it will still be an order of magnitude higher than we can actually afford. It'll be in the order of 200 megawatts for a, an exascale computer. So the second main point I want to make is that the problem today of computing performance, and the problem is really about computing performance, not just um, an exascale, is really one of, um, is about this energy problem. And it's a problem throughout the computing industry. It's not just a problem in whether we can build an exascale computer. Um, the graph that you see here shows different things about the, the performance of processor chips. And the important point that I want to make is that um, in 2004, something very dramatic happened, which was in spite of the fact that, that we were able to put more more transistors on a chip every couple of years, we can't make the processors go any faster. And that means it will be much more difficult to build an exascale computer starting with a petascale computer than it was to get from a terascale computer to a petascale computer. Because the computer, the, the processors will not be any faster than they are today. Instead, we'll have many more of those processors as opposed to um, faster processors. And the key challenge and the reason that we don't actually get processors that are any faster today is because they're too hot. So all of you who have a laptop um, know that, that laptops used to be something that you would put on your lap. Laptops today are often too hot. In fact, there are warnings against putting laptops on your lap, and that's because there's so much energy being used by those processors um, and, and so much energy actually even leaking out of the processors um, that they become very hot. And that's the, the, a testament to the amount of energy that's being used, even with the individual processors. If you're interested in more of the technical details, which I won't try to go into today, there's actually a study that was done by the National Academies um, NRC group that I was involved with, and there will be a symposium next Tuesday on that going through all of the, the details, the ta technical challenges on the um, hardware and software side, as well as some of the other um, opportunities that we could get from computing performance. The point, though, is that this, this report, by the way, does not mention the word exascale. What it does mention is the challenges of computing performance, and that um, while exascale is the milestone that we look at in terms of whether we're able to build such a computer, the real issue is investing in the technology to be able to improve computing performance. Um, just to give you an idea of how you might save energy, your, the, the processor that's in your cell phone uses much less energy than the processors that are in the computer systems that we run at, um, at the NERSC facility. And in fact, it uses much less energy than the processors that are even in your laptop today. So and that's the size of a cell phone processor up there in the corner versus more of a server processor. That's an Intel Nehalem processor over on the right. Um, but it's not just about size. It's actually about the power that they consume as well. So one way you could look at the problem is could you build a supercomputer that would actually be useful for science out of the kinds of processors that we build iPods out of. Now, are we going to take a billion iPods and string them together? Absolutely not. Um, that would give us a very ineffective machine for science, but can we use the techniques that people have been using to develop um, processors that run at very low power because you care about a battery life in, a, in an iPod um, in order to build a supercomputer? Um, so there's our kind of estimate of, of what the um, power would look like if we don't invest in any kind of an R&D program to really try to um, work at, on an exascale design and lower the energy usage. It's around 130 um, 
megawatts, I should say. And um, if we instead use little tiny processors of the kind that are in the iPod, we might get that down to about 75 watts. Um, if we then try to, we, one of the main problems, and this is something that's easy to overlook, is a lot of the energy in these computer systems actually go into the memory system. The U.S. has one major manufacturer in memory technology, um, and uh, what we, 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 so we have to really worry about um, how the, that energy, that memory technology is going to improve in order to also bring the power down. And that, and the um, memory technology as well as the interconnect are key points in terms of trying to hit that energy target. Now, We've just decided we're going to build a computer that looks very different than the kind of computers that we build today. It'll have very tiny processors in it um, that probably don't run very fast. They'll run at about the same speed that they do today, so they won't get much faster. And they're going to be organized very differently because we'll have billions of them. And what that means is that we need to redesign the software and we re need to redesign the algorithms even that run on top of these things. So um, you probably are, are told that um, communication is very important. Well, from an energy perspective, which is what we care about, communication is very expensive. And so what we need to do is to, is to completely de redesign algorithms and software to avoid communication. So this is kind of how a coordinated program puts all of these pieces together. It's really a, uh, what we really need is a research activity that combines all of the different aspects. And um, if we look at kind of the, a more detailed list of the challenges, I won't try to read through it here, but just say that um, people have gone through and sort of summarized all of these key challenges, some of which I've talked about here. Um, but if you look at those, those are not just challenges for building an exascale computer. Almost all of them are true for just trying to improve computing performance. So um, unlike the last 20 years where we were able to rely on, on processors getting faster, um, this is going to really be important across all different machine scales. Now, you may say, why do we need these supercomputers when we have the cloud? And the cloud is a wonderful thing. It allows anybody to get access to computing as long as they have a credit card with a balance uh, that they can charge against. And it is a very convenient way to get access to large amounts of computing power. However, um, for the science problems that you've heard about today, they're very tightly coupled computational problems. They communicate frequently between the different processors. The cloud, web services, is a bunch of independent people all trying to, to um, get uh, some information out of the web and it's a very different workload. So we've done some analysis even looking at fairly small problems, not looking at the kinds of large applications that you've been hearing about. And even for those small parallel jobs, it runs about 50 times slower to run it in one of these commercial clouds. Why have we not looked at the very large scientific applications? Because it would take us so long we haven't even been, been able to submit those jobs so far. And it's very expensive, by the way. So, um, and on the other hand, um, cloud providers have the same problem that those of us who are providing scientific computing facilities have, which is that the energy that are going, that's going into the computer systems is growing substantially and the cost associated with that are growing. So I think this really speaks to the need to, to really think about the whole problem, not just, it's not just about building a bigger, faster computer, it's really about um, bringing the applications along with the hard changes that are going to have to happen in hardware, in the memory technology, and the processors in order to build machines that can actually allow us to solve these scientific challenges. <laughs>